Uh, many times people uh, have challenges when they work their way through what the building code, international building code, uh, says and what it expects from the, the standpoint of providing the fire resistance. And so to, with today's session, uh, I hope to at least help you in that regard to look at what the approved methods are that are identified in Chapter 7 of the International Building Code, uh, take a look at some of the technical resources that are available to uh, document fire resistance to meet the types of construction that the building code expects, and of course then try to use some uh, real, world, real world examples to show the application of uh, these provisions so that we get just get a sense of how they can be applied. And of course there's a variety of uh, examples that can be out there, so I've tried to keep some basic simple ones, but still enough to be able to, to uh, show it uh, technically what how to do it. Um, we will be working on the using the 2018 International Building Code. I know in the not too distant future, the 2021 edition will be out. Um, much of the material that we'll be discussing today. Uh, as far as the 2018 edition is concerned, is also in the 2021. So you'll find this applicable uh, whether you're in a, eventually about to adopt the 2021 or whether you use the 2018. I also would like to mention here, too, that uh, previous editions of the International Building Code, 2015 edition and the 2012 edition or even earlier than that, much of this material is in those uh, editions of the Building Code also. So I don't think you'll find it as any great surprise. Uh, I just use the 2018 to, as to have a fixed point in time uh, for us to be able to use to uh, to present the material. Uh, one of the first things that you know, and when we want to talk about fire resistance, I always want to start with uh, Table 601 out of uh, Chapter 6 of the IBC, and the primary reason is because that is a is the most primary part of the code where it tells us what the fire resistance ratings are required to be when it comes to the structural requirements for the building. And of course, it, you see across the top the types 1 through uh, 5. Uh, real quickly, types 1 and 2 are non-combustible construction. Type 3 is a combination of non-combustible and, uh, uh, and combustible materials. Type 4 is heavy timber construction, and type 5 is typically combustible construction like wood frame. And of course, the thing that we're going to be focusing most on uh, is to realize we're looking at the building elements themselves and what fire resistance ratings are required. And the areas I'm mostly going to focus on today is going to be uh, structural frames, floors, and roofs, or just talk about them in, in general terms. Uh, I we will be looking at that aspect. I do want to make a distinction here, though, just at least for purposes of a applying the building code, and that is to realize it does use a term, primary structural frame, and then you'll notice the two other arrows point to floors and secondary members and roofs and secondary members. The main reason I point that out is to realize that the fire resistance ratings for the primary structural frame, especially in the type 1 and 2 construction, are going to be uh, different. They're more they're more robust for the type 1B construction versus the type 1 uh, excuse me type 1A construction versus the type 1B construction, and so you, sometimes you need to be conscious of if you're dealing with a structural element and trying to decide some fire resistance ratings. Realize it can vary depending on what is the, whether it's the structural frame or whether it's the uh, secondary members, and so there is a definition in Chapter 2 of the uh, IBC that tells you that the primary structural frame is considered columns. It's considered any structural members that actually connect to the columns, such as beams and girders, trusses. It is any floor or roof members if they have direct connection to the columns. And then it is any bracing members that are essential to stability of the primary structural frame under gravity loads. And I want to pause a minute and make sure I repeat that, under gravity loads. So if there's bracing members that are there to hold the building up in a, a non-event condition, just for pure stability, then that's what those are the kinds of members that are considered part of the structural frame. If the bracing is there for some other uh, type of loading condition, let's say a wind or, or earthquake, uh, that, that's a whole different animal. The code does not really expect that the building is going to have to face uh, an intense fire condition at the same time that a uh, 
uh, other structural event, uh, structural disasters occurring like an earthquake or a hurricane. That's not to say that they can't happen, but the code is understanding that it is only trying to deal with one particular uh, uh, disaster at a time. In this case, we're talking the situation of fire. Secondary members then are any members not directly connected to the columns and floors and uh, roof members that are not directly to, uh, connected to the columns and then any bracing members that are not part of the primary uh, structural frame which we just talked about previous in the previous slide. So this is just a re fairly, fairly simple schematic but I use it just to make the comment. You will notice I, I sit, sit there and have the system of some columns and beams running between columns uh, those elements would be the kind that would be considered part of the primary structural frame.